Well, good morning, every. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. You're awake. Good. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Cynthia Robinson, and I direct the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships. And on behalf of the fellowship program and AAAS, it is a pleasure to welcome you here to our distinguished lecture series. Um, this is the second in a series of four events that we're running this year in celebration of our 40th anniversary. And I am very pleased and excited to be introducing um, our speaker this evening, Dr. Moises Naim. He is a man truly of many talents. He's an award-winning journalist, author, host, and producer of a weekly television program, also former editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine for 14 years, during which time um, the publication received National Magazine's um, Award for General Excellence three times under his leadership. He was just recently announced um, as one of the world's top 100 thinkers by the British magazine Prospect. He's also served in senior positions in government in Venezuela. He's an accomplished businessman with credentials directing a national bank. He is a successful and sought after international nonprofit leader, serving as an executive director of the World Bank, as a member of the boards of the National Endowment of Democracy, the International Crisis Group, and the Open Society Foundation. And he's also currently chair of the board of both the Group of 50, the G50, and of Population Action International. In addition, he's a scholar and an educator. Dr. Naeem earned both his master's and his doctorate degrees at MIT. He was a professor of business and economics, as well as the dean of Venezuela's main business school. He is currently so, so a senior associate in the International Economics Program at the Carne Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. As you're aware, he's an author. He has, in fact, authored numerous books on international economics and politics, including Illicit, which was published in 2005, and the topic of tonight's presentation, The End of Power. That was just released a few months ago, and already it is out of print. So to offer you just a snippet of some of the reviews of the publication, a timely and timeless book. Analytically sophisticated, the end of power makes a truly important contribution, persuasively portraying a compelling dynamic of change cutting across multiple game boards of the global political matrix. After you read the end of power, you will see the world through different eyes. I think this evening's presentation will give you just a taste of that. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moises Naeem. trying to make sure that this is taped well. The end of power is here. <laughs> <laughs> shh, shh. 
I hope I don't have to start all over again because I don't remember what I said. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, I felt, uh, and I can then perhaps discuss with you a little bit what is the, the intellectual journey that took me to this idea. But um, I felt that something important was happening with power and about power, that there was a profound mut mutation going on. Uh, that had to do with the way power is wielded, acquired, lost, in all areas of human enterprise. That uh, there was something going on with power in the military, and in science, and in business, and in governments, and in politics, in labor unions, in religions. Wherever humans organize to accomplish something, power is present, and something was happening to power in those activities. We know that the, the power is changing and shifting. You know that. That's, there's nothing new about that. Uh, that, that it, we see it on television and on the, the news and, uh, and, and, and in, in the conversation everywhere. Power is shifting from Europe and the United States to Asia. It's shifting from north to south. Is shifting from presidential palaces to squares, to public squares, and to streets. Uh, it's shifting from huge companies, century old companies that dominated a business sector for, for, for years, to newcomers, to startups. And it's even shifting in some places from men to women. Shifting. I'm saying that, yes, all of that is happening and is very profound. But something more is happening. And that is that power is not just shifting. Power is decaying. That means that when it shifts from A to B, what arrives to B is less power than what left A. By that, I mean that power has become, by decay, I mean that power has become easier to acquire, much harder to use, and easier to lose. It's more ephemeral. That doesn't mean that there are not uh, a lot of powerful people and institutions in the world today. The President of the United States or China or Russia, these are powerful people. The Pentagon, the Vatican, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party, those are powerful institutions. Goldman Sachs and Exxon and the big banks, those are powerful institutions. The big universities, of course they have power. What I'm saying is that they have less power than they had in the past. And uh, I, I, the book, as I said, is, you know, I rest that assertion on a bunch of data that I think proves the case. And I'm not going to bore you uh, with, the, with the details, but let me just give you a taste of some of the numbers. Think, for example, about uh, power in national politics. It is very clear that uh, national politics around the world are becoming Italian. <laughs> By that I mean uh, governments that are democracies, that are having a very hard time making decisions that are timely and effective and make a dent on the problems that they are supposed to solve. It used to be Italy. Now it's a few blocks from here. Uh, in, the, in the Congress, the sequester and, and, the, and the fiscal cliff and all of the things that we have seen are very good evidence of the difficulty that these very sophisticated, very developed set of democratic institutions are having to just make very basic foundational decisions like the decision of how to tax and spend. That is something that you would expect that a mature democracy doesn't have to debate, that that's something you can debate about. Uh, details, but not about the fundamental decisions uh, that, uh, that, that about tax and, taxing and spending. The, and this is democracies, uh, and I'll get back to it, but it's not just democracies. You can just see how the world has become very uncomfortable and very insecure for dictators. The number of dictatorships, the number of tyrants in the world has plummeted. Uh, just the sheer number of countries that, where uh, citizens uh, are elect their leaders is now half of humanity. 
half of the people that live in the world today have elected their leaders. You can quibble about the nature of democracy and the definitions of democracy, but those are, those are facts. The numbers are that today in the world, half of the, of the population live, were able to cast a vote for their leaders. Uh, and it's not only that, uh, is that, uh, and, and you, you have seen what's happening to dictators and to uh, tyrants that are trying to, 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 to retain power. They try very hard to look like democracies. Think about Russia, think about all of the contortions that Vladimir Putin has gone through in order to uh, appear as a Democrat. You know, he has elections and then he says, well, you know, I did talk to my, my prime minister and we decided to, to switch. Now he's going to take my position. And I, you know, it's all that. So you ask yourself, why does he have to do all this? Why does he, in the past, he would just have declared himself the, the, the boss without having to go through all of the, the masquerading uh, as a democracy, right? But at the same time, you see Vladimir Putin uh, under pressure. People in Russia are taken to the streets despite very harsh and very, very aggressive behavior uh, on the part of the government in terms of repressing it. So that's for, for authoritarianism and the trends in the world. But then in democracies, it is what I said before about uh, becoming more Italian. In fact, there is a concept coined by Professor Frank, uh, Francis Fukuyama. He invented a, a, an idea or a description that he, of these modern democracies, that he said are becoming vitocracies. Vitocracies, meaning that these are uh, uh, democratic systems in which you have a, a profusion of actors, of groups, even individuals, that have just enough power to block the initiatives of others, but no one has sufficient power to push through an agenda, a vision, uh, a strategy. That is in part a reflection of the fact that if you look at the numbers of electoral victories, you will see that they are shrinking. Landslide victories in elections are becoming endangered species, are, be are becoming extinct. Of course, you have occasions and exceptions here and there. But if you trace from 1970 to last year, and you see, let me look at what was the margin uh, of the percentage over w that, that, that a pr prime minister or a president won an election and became the head of state, you will see an amazing, amazing decline uh, of uh, the, the, the percentage uh, uh, over, with, with which uh, presidents are elected. Mostly they win by a hair. And mostly electorates around the world are sending the message, I'm going to put you in charge of the executive, but I'm going to give the other guys, your opposition, the legislative, and Congress, and parliaments. And that forces the world to enter into a very complicated uh, set of arrangements, coalitions, unwieldy coalitions of very, very uh, uh, uneasy uh, um, uh, allies, and unstable and very hard to make decisions, and very hard to make hard decisions because they need to be negotiated and, uh, and, and resolved, and very often just settling for the minimum common denominator. Out of the 34 largest democracies in the world, uh, the members of the OECD, uh, the, cl the club of rich countries, 34 members, only four have a situation where the head of state has friends in Congress, meaning that his party controls Congress. In 30 out of the 34 uh, countries of the OECD, the situation is one in which the government, uh, the president's party, has the executive and the opposition controls uh, parliament. And then that president uh, very often feels like Gulliver, tied down by the Lilliputians. Uh, a wide variety of actors activists, the media, financial uh, players, uh, state and local governments. There is a very strong, very powerful shift of power from the capitals and from the federal government to state and local governments. Last week, there was a very interesting book issued by Brookings that's about the United States that says 
the, the action is no longer, not even state and local governments. The action is in the big metropolitan centers of the nation. That's where decisions are made, that's where the action is, that's where politics is happening, that is where political innovation is taking place in the big cities. And so here you have a president that is tied down by all of these actors uh, that has uh, very significant restrictions on what it, what it can do. Um, there was a, a, a very revealing piece of information that I thought was very interesting by President Obama when he, he was being interviewed just prior to the most recent election. And uh, it was a conversation in, in the private residence in the White House. And President Obama was in a reflective mode. And, uh, and the journalist started talking to him about power. How, you know, how did it feel uh, to be a powerful person in the free world, as they used to call the US president. And President Obama started, looked reflective and thought, and then said, look outside the window. Do you know, do you see that patio over there? That was built by Ronald Reagan. He was, the story is that he was chatting with Nancy one day and said, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have a patio out there in the, in, 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 behind the, the White House? And you know, yes, and you know, they, they ask, and uh, in a few weeks the patio was built. He said, I don't feel I can do that, said Obama. Do you imagine the national scandal if I decide, you know, patio gate? Uh, <laughs> you know, do you imagine, you know, Fox News for three weeks denouncing the distraction of the, 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 the resources of the state in building the patio? You know, it's not something that I, maybe that it's just me, but I, I don't feel I can do that. It is, of course, a caricature, an exaggeration, but I think it, it, it illustrates the kinds of instincts, the kinds of calculations, and the kinds of restrictions that this very powerful person has. And this is something that I have had the, the opportunity to check with many heads of state and many former heads of state and, 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 and lead, political leaders. They all feel um, that people have expectations about the, what they can do and the power of their office that are way uh, uh, beyond what they actually can, can achieve. And, uh, and that, of course, has consequences, and we can discuss them. But then take another example from the world of war. A very interesting uh, example there that illustrates what I mean is uh, that of the Somali pirates. Here we have a bunch of former fishermen who could not continue to make a living uh, in, their, in those seas in the Gulf of Aden for a variety of reasons that include climate change and, and other factors. So they decided and to take to the high seas or just a few miles away with their rickety boats and outboard motors and all Kalashnikovs and, 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 and guns and they would hijack some of the biggest ships in the world. Big tankers, big oil tankers, big cargo ships, big yachts for ransom. And it became an industry. And the world has reacted to that and has deployed in the Gulf of Aden one of the most sophisticated fleet uh, ever assembled. NATO is there, and the Russians are there, and Ukrainians, and the Chinese, and the Turks, and Everyone is plying those waters to stop this from happening because, of course, it, there, this is a major commercial route for, for, for international trade. And they have not been able to do it. Now, I'm not saying that the pirates are going to win over this uh, uh, major assembly of uh, military power, but surely they are denying uh, these, these powerful players the ability to impose their will in, in that area which is exactly what is happening to, with the Taliban. You know, the Taliban is, are not likely to definitely win over the, the, the ISA force and the coalition forces in Afghanistan, but surely denying uh, those players, the United States and, and the allies, the ability to impose their will in Afghanistan, and on and on and on and on. And that is happening with war. And one of the things that is happening with war is, of course, that weaponry has become far more available. The debate in the United States now is about drones, the legality of using drones. 
that debate is very soon is going to be displaced by another debate. And that is, what do we do when everyone has a drone? Drones are becoming very inexpensive. And all nations and all groups, even individuals, can have their own drone. And some of them may decide to just stick a couple of dynamite sticks or uh, plastic explosives and fly those drones over a stadium full of people. So the IEDs, the, the uh, improvised explosive device, may migrate from the subsoil to the skies. That debate is going to be far more transcendental for each of us than the debate about the legality of uh, using drones to attack uh, people outside the United States, which I believe it's a very legitimate, very valid debate. But I'm just presenting you uh, how the world looks when you think about it from a different perspective uh, associated with this view of power. And uh, these are not just anecdotes. There are studies that, that, that illustrate quite clearly what's happening in the world of war. There is a Harvard scholar called Ivan Aregintov who did a study. He looked at uh, parties of war, and he was able to measure uh, the relative strength and relative power by the traditional metrics of uh, war, number of soldiers and weapons and um, everything else. And he found out that in the wars that had taken place between 1800 and 1850, the weak part would, would, would lose most of the time. Only 12% of those conflicts, uh, the weak side won, 12% of the time. Most of the, the, the time, of course, was won by the strong army. Then he did the same study for conflicts, for armed conflicts, between 1950 and 1998. And guess what? During that modern period, the weak side won 55% of the time, more often than the strong side. And that is the whole conversation and the narrative about uh, uh, asymmetric wars and what's happening to the distribution of power and how power is acquired and used in the, in the world of war. And then there is the private sector, which is one of the most surprising uh, areas. Uh, of this conversation because given that we know that wealth and income are concentrating in the United States and in the world, and because we typically associate that power, that money buys power, therefore if money is concentrated, if capital income is concentrated, therefore power is going to be concentrated. And of course that's true. With the difference that the, all the evidence that you will see in the book is that, yes, power is concentrating, but it's becoming very slippery to be at the top of uh, economic and business power. CEOs are being fired at unprecedented rates. The turnover among the CEOs of the 2,500 largest companies in the world last year reached an unprecedented rate, double what it used to be. The companies that are at the top of their league are also uh, experiencing a very, very uh, high level of turnover. There's a study that uh, calculated in the, if, if a company was at the top of the league, at the top 20% of the sector, what was the probability that that company would still be at the 20% uh, level, at the top 20% five years hence? It was 90% in 1980. Last year, it was three times less. So the probability in the past was that once you made it to the top, you stay there as a company. Most recently, depends. There is a, a much higher probability that uh, you would lose that position and be displaced by others. Uh, and there are some very good examples of this. And uh, uh, think about, for example, think about Kodak. Kodak, of course, you know, who, who here hasn't had a Kodak moment? Uh, <laughs> Kodak was the dominant uh, company in the world of photography, films, cameras. Uh, Kodak is now bankrupt. Kodak is in bankruptcy proceedings. They missed the digital revolution. They did not uh, uh, move fast enough to, to, from, from their uh, chemical-based uh, uh, processes to the new digital photography. 
they had the technology, but they decided that they will hold on it because that would cannibalize them a lot of money that they were doing with the traditional ways of, of managing. Well, well that, that essentially sunk them into oblivion. But the interesting story here is that the same week, by coincidence, the same week that Kodak was uh, in bankruptcy procedures, a small company, three years old, with 13 employees, average age, 13 years old, well, a little more, but very young. Uh, very, a company with 13 very young employees with three years of age was sold for a billion dollars. The name of the company, Instagram. And what, it, what do they do? They're an app in your phone that helps you manage your pictures. I'm not suggesting that Kodak went out of business because of Instagram. I am just fascinated by the coincidence of uh, these two events and how much they tell us about what is the nature of business competition in, in this time and age. And, and there are some more examples uh, about, uh, about business that I can discuss with you. And then there is, I, I can go on, talk about sports, uh, labor unions. The la labor unions, it's fascinating what's happening with organized labor around the world and how also there, the traditional uh, power centers are undergoing the kind of transformation uh, that I th see in other sectors. And then there is a fascinating sector uh, where this is happening, which is religion, organized, established religion. It turns out that uh, the international, the, 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 the division of the market share for souls in the world is shifting. And think about that, because that you would expect that that is one of the most permanent, most rigid, most hard to change. You know, people don't change religions that easily. Uh, people tend to stick to the religions of their ancestors, their parents, and so on. Well, the Catholic Church is um, essentially losing uh, uh, followers at an astonishing rate in Latin America, in parts of Africa, parts of Asia. In Brazil, in 1970, the, the, the census asked, what's your religion? 90% of Brazilians uh, checked, I am a Catholic. In the 2010 census, the 90% went down to 65%. Half a million Catholics in Brazil leave the church. Same is happening in Nigeria, same is happening in other countries, same is happening in the Philippines. And where are they going? To which religion are they flocking? To all kinds of newcomers, startups, <laughs> what they call organic churches, Pentecostalists, uh, new forms of evangelical Christianity, new forms and new ways of uh, practicing religion uh, that are not unlike, they're, they're, they're not part of the structure of a centralized structure with a centralized dogma with centralized authority. They are far more fragmented. They are far more flexible and different. And I think they, 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 they are, I'm fascinated by the example because I think it concentrates and this in a distilled interesting way a lot of the trends that I describe uh, that's happening in other sectors. The question then is why? Why is power becoming uh, easier to get, but so much harder to use and more constrained and, and so ephemeral? The initial reaction when you ask those question is the internet, of course. The answer is social media. It's Twitter and Facebook and social media and the internet and everything that we know is happening with the internet. And I disagree with that. Uh, because, they, of course, I don't disagree with a very powerful effect of social media and the internet and all that, but those are tools, and tools have users, and those users have direction and motivation. So far more interesting than the tools is to understand what is the direction and the motivations of the people that use social media, that use the internet to change the world. And then there is a long list of factors that I think are at play and explain the trends uh, that uh, I've been talking about. All of them, and what helped me organize those, is a concept that I bring from economics, essentially from the economics of imperfect competition. 
uh, and have to do with the idea of barriers to entry. Those in power, in business or any other area, have unique assets that protect them. They have something that others don't have and that are very hard to replicate. A big brand name, millions of followers, millions of voters, a lot of money, something special, a charismatic leader, or a tradition and history, you name it, a special technology, brand names, you name it. Those special assets are the ones that shield those in power from the challenges of uh, the rivals, the existing or new rivals that want to be part of that, that want to take power away. And what I say is that there is a slew of forces that are weakening the, those defenses, that are weakening the shields that are protecting the powerful. I group them in three major categories of change that I call revolutions. One is the more revolution. The second is the mobility revolution. And the third is the mentality revolution. The more revolution captures the fact that we live in a world of profusion, in a world of abundance, in a world of more. We have more of everything. We have more of us. Start with that. Uh, there are more people than ever in the planet. It took us to, until 1950 to get to the 2 million people mark. Now we add 2 billion people every 20 years. We're now at 7 billion. But it's not just that there are more of us. We are living in the youngest planet ever, unevenly distributed, but we are living in a planet that has more young people, the number of people in the planet today that is between 20 and 30 years old is unprecedented, never before in history. Of course, that coexists with the fact that there are some countries where uh, that's not true. Japan and parts of Europe uh, and uh, part in the United States, you know, you have a lot of uh, older people, but on average in the world, this is a very young planet in terms of the population. And it's not just plentiful and young, it's concentrated. It's concentrated in cities. In 2007, for, for the first time in history, more people live in city than, than in, in the urban, in, this, in the rural areas. They were living a very, very fast process of urbanization, and people are flocking to the streets. 65 million people a year, seven Chicago's every year, people that move from uh, farms to cities. So more, more concentrated, younger, and more educated and more affluent. This is the wealthiest planet we have had in history. The size of the global GDP is today 12 times larger than it was in 1980, 12 times. The size of global GDP today is twice what it was in the year 2000. In the middle, we had the worst economic crisis in the last 50 years. Despite the crash, despite the financial crash, the, the, the recession and everything else, today our economy is twice as large as it was in 2000, including that of Africa, for example. Africa's economy today is twice as larger, which is a surprise. But it's not only that. It is also that um, affluence is now spreading. In the last decade, according to the World Bank, 125 people were lifted out of poverty every day. I said every day. 125 people lifted out of poverty. Now, they are not driving cars and they are not wealthy, and, but they have now disposable income that they can use at their discretion. And you know what? They also eat three times a day, which was not normal just a few years ago. And they have the option of buying more stuff for their houses and improve their housing condition and more medicines for their children and more educational opportunities and uh, more hope. 
There are 36 countries, 36 countries that according to the World Bank have been lifted out of what they're they had a category of uh, poor countries to middle income countries. Countries that have you know, on average middle income levels. When you have, and I can go on with the age of abundance, the age of more, pick any indicator you want that traces the human condition and look at the numbers in 1980 or 2000 and look at the numbers today. And you're gonna see a skyrocketing exponential curve. Everything that has to do with the human condition is exploding in size and at a great speed. Caloric intake, uh, educational attainment, anything. Of course, it's very unevenly distributed. In some countries, in sub-Saharan Africa, things are not going as well as in other places where there's fast growth, in Southeast Asia, for example, parts of Latin America. But on average, uh, the world uh, and the human condition has improved very significantly in the last uh, 20, 30 years. The more has consequences for power. It's much easier to control and wield power over a group of people that are hungry and distributed and isolated and illiterate and misinformed and struggling to make a living and just get to the end of the day than to control and wield power of a group of people that are young, that are hanging out together in cities, uh, that are well-fed, well-educated, well-informed, uh, uh, and so on. But it's not just that there is more of everything, but the more moves more. And that's the second revolution, that's the mobility revolution. And I think it's straightforward and you understand what it is. The statistics there are also quite incredible. Um, the, we have 37% more uh, of migrants around the world today than in the last decade. 37% of humanity now lives I'm sorry, 37% more uh, immigrants now live in, in a different country. Last year, for the first time ever, tourists reached the one billion mark. That means a billion humans visited another country. And then, of course, there is all of the mobility of money, capital investment, exchange, you know, foreign exchange, uh, business, trade, pandemics, ideas, ideologies, political parties, activists, NGOs, scientists, you name it, it's moving. And it's moving all over the place. And power needs a captive audience. Power needs will control over a well-defined place where people over which you exert power cannot move too far. That's what the first thing that tyrants do is to close the borders. Well, now it's very hard. And that's the mobility revolution. And all of that together creates profound changes in aspirations, expectations, hopes, and values. And that is the mentality revolution. The University of Michigan launched uh, 40 years ago, I think, uh, an initiative called the World Values Survey. They went around the world every year and they surveyed people about their values. Their sample was designed in a way that they capture 85% of humanity. And if you look at the numbers traced over time about values, what people value, what they think, what they expect, you will see amazing transformations in the way people think and the way people expect and hope and, and dream and want. And uh, the evidence is overwhelming uh, uh, that, that that is happening. and. Uh, one, one factoid that I think is very revealing and that I am fascinated by is that, for example, divorce rates in India are soaring among the elderly, initiated by the woman. They are walking out of arranged marriages that were set up 30, 40 years ago. Now, not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago, now. Why? because of the three revolutions. They know more, they have more, they, they are more capable, they have been empowered to change this very traditional way of organizing family life. The same, by the way, is happening in the countries in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf. 
The three revolutions then have very, very important weakening consequences for the barriers that shield the powerful. The more revolution overwhelms the barriers. The mobility revolution helps challengers circumvent the barriers. And the mentality revolution undermines the barriers. You put all of these three th things together and you shake them and you have a world in which power is easier to acquire, harder to use, and much easier to lose. One more question, and I am running out of time and I wanna leave time for your questions. One obvious question is, so what? Who cares? Why, why should I worry about this? Well, you shouldn't worry about this. In fact, the trends that I describe are very positive. There's plenty to welcome, celebrate, and applaud about what's happening. This is a world of opportunity. This is a world where a young entrepreneur can create an Instagram-like company that makes a billion dollars uh, sale. Uh, this is a world in which an activist can change the world. Recently, there was this fantastic story about a nine-year-old girl, a schoolgirl in England, and she went every day to school and she hated the food that was served at school. And she started taking pictures of what uh, was being served and posted in her blog, she started a blog about food in her cafeteria. And others started doing the same. And all of a sudden, the parents discovered that their children were being fed garbage uh, <laughs> and very unhealthy, fried, horrible food. And there was a commotion. And it was public schools that, that, that had a very, you know, the ministries of education, as you know, are some of the most rigid bureaucracies ever. Well, they had to change. There was a, a, an uproar. And this little girl, just by taking pictures of the food and posting it, achieved a major change. That's a world that is a better world. That is a world where tyrants and monopolies uh, are more insecure. This is a world where excluded people have more chance of inclusion. This is a world where uh, people that have uh, ideas can thrive. This is a world where people can find capital for their ideas in ways that are unprecedented. Now, there is a downside. And the downside uh, of uh, the end of power, as we knew it, has to do with the world of politics. We, what I just described, uh, is a world where governments are having a hard time uh, responding to the needs of societies and in today's world. The world of vitocracies, the notion that we are all Italians, uh, that have a hard time getting governments that can deliver timely, effective decisions is a problem. Uh, and it's a problem that is creating all kinds of reactions, uh, either the emergence of what I call in the book the terrible simplifiers, the demagogues that respond to the frustration and the anxiety of voters by offering and promising and persuading them that they have the answer. Uh, people that are fed up with corruption, like, for example, the Russians in the 90s, they were fed up with corruption. They elected Vladimir Putin. In Italy in the 90s, they were fed up with corruption. They wanted someone to just clean house and throw out the rascals and throw out the politicians and have a new beginning without corruption. They elected Silvio Berlusconi. <laughs> in Venezuela, the same thing. They were fed up with the corruption of the old regime and everything else. They throw everyone out and they elected Hugo Chavez. That is happening in the world. Or the one in, in Europe, the ones, the, 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 the profusion, the mushrooming of movements that are anti-immigrant, that are uh, exponents of ideas that we thought had been abandoned and they're back with us. So that's a, that's a downside of a world that is becoming more complicated that has one implication, has many, but it has one that uh, in, in my, Mine is the most worrisome one. Uh, and that is the inability of the world to act collectively in a very effective way. <coughs> Globalization and other forces and the global economy and, and technology and other forces 
are creating a long list of problems that cannot be solved by any country acting alone. And you know what that list is. It includes climate change, but it's also nuclear proliferation, is a control of pandemics, is how to manage a uh, financial crisis that spread uh, around the world, creating a lot of human suffering. It's a long list of problems that no country can solve alone. Think, for example, what does the Syrian crisis, the massacres in Syria, climate change, and the economic crisis in Europe have in common? What do they have in common? Well, we, we know we, everyone wants to stop them, and no one seems to have the power to do it. The end of power. And there is a long list of, of things like that that require collective international action. And at the same time that the need for that kind of, a, of response, of coordinated action, is soaring, the capacity of the world to act together is either stagnant or declining. That gap is creating the world's most dangerous deficit because we are not reacting in a timely way to deal and tackle problems that are going to become huge crises for us. Example is climate change, of course. And why? Why is this happening? Well, because the governments that are sitting around the table to make those decisions are vitocracies, are weak. They don't have a mandate. They cannot reach a deal and do the compromising and do the horse trading and do the, the kind of uh, concessions that are needed in any negotiation. They cannot afford to go back to their constituencies at home and say, guess what? I decided that in order to deal with climate change, we are going to do one, two, three, and four th uh, items of action, uh, action items that are going to, you know, some of them are, have costs for you. And that then uh, creates uh, stagnation uh, and uh, delays in decisions that are indispensable and that are urgent. And that is one of the aspects of the world uh, in which power is no longer what it used to be. Uh, let me finish here and take your, your questions and comments and uh, reactions. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Herb Lin from the National Academy of Sciences. You described a uh, situation of the decay of power, uh, political power in particular, uh, and, and uh, across many nations, including the United States, and you point to, to us th you know, three blocks away here, uh, which is very poignant for those of us who work in the policy process. My question is whether you think that the, the, whether the decay of power that you describe affects both right and left symmetrically. So I can imagine, I mean, the, the Republicans have certainly um, exploited their minority status in, in the House very, very effectively to, as you say, block. Can't push anything much anything through, but they can block. Can you imagine the Democrats doing the same thing in a reverse situation? I mean, and that's just an example. The question is whether the decay is sort of independent of whether you're on the right or on the left. Yeah, I think so. Just think about the meaning of the Tea Party. The Tea Party is nothing but a hostile takeover of the Republican Party uh, that injected into the, that party uh, forces to take positions that are very hard to sustain and that are, given the demographics of the country and other considerations, uh, create a very, very challenging situation for the Republican Party. The Republican Party today, today, had to vote for policies that are abhorrent to many of the members. I'm talking about immigration reforms, of course, that was this voted today by the Senate. That idea, with amnesty and all of the other very threatening concepts to the Republicans, um, are just evidence that they didn't have the power to stop it. They did not have the power to stop the takeover of uh, the, the, the Tea Party, and they did not have the power to stop this other trend. So yes, I, I don't know about behavior, you know, blocking behavior and that, that's big, but what I don't have any doubt is that, yes, uh, the trends that I have described uh, are not selective. They affect everyone. 
Hi, thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. My name is Maria Rachowska and I'm a AAAS fellow at the State Department. And I had a couple of questions. My first question is about the point that you were making um, relating how mobility in the world is decreasing power. And what I wonder about with that is, it seems to me that when it depends on your definition of power in that if you think about, for example, terrorist networks, then perhaps mobility is the way that they maintain their power. So their lack of certain concentration may actually help them to continue. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that and other I lost one word. What, what is the example you gave? I'm sorry. Terrorist networks. Terrorist example. network that help, are held by mobility, yes. Right. Yes. And so, so I'm curious how you define power. And my second question is, so you mentioned some of the complications about addressing sustainability issues with, with the more. Well, do you have any suggestions of how we can address those issues, given vitocracies and other issues? So with the first one, yes, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the mobility, you know, I wrote a book called Illicit that was about network, criminal networks that included but transcended criminal networks. And the essence of the story there is the mobility. These are very agile, transnational, stateless uh, movements. And there is an asymmetry between those kinds of movements that are highly mobile, as you say, and nation states that are just uh, operating within national borders. And, and of course, uh, those movements, the criminals, the transnational networks of illicit traders, and the networks are part of the list of Lilliputians that are limiting the, 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 the powers of governments, except that uh, at some point, if you become too big, the end of power also takes you down. Uh, and, and, you, and we have seen it, and uh, the, 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 it's very interesting to see what has happened, for example, with the Mexican cartels. Uh, the Mexican cartels used to be, or the, or the Colombian cartels, they used to be a very small numbers. Now they are fragmented into thousands of pieces. And the, one of the problems is that it's very hard to, to, to pin them down because they are dif very diffuse. And uh, so that you have a point in, there in terms that the mobility helps uh, and gives power to these uh, terrorist groups and other illicit networks. But at the same time, the more power it gives them, the larger they become, the more vulnerable they become to the other forces that uh, limit and constrain their ability to, to wield power. That's one, one, one aspect of your question. The second aspect of your question is what to do with, how do you fight mitocracies? The reason why mitocracies are becoming very effective is because we are choking on checks and balances. The, one of the trends in the world today is the decline of trust. Trust in government and trust in institutions. Every single survey saw, shows that people don't trust, don't trust their politicians, don't trust their institutions, and now, even now the, 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 the trust in the Supreme Court is an all-time low. And this has been going out for a long time, starting perhaps with Watergate and Vietnam. It's been a, a, a very long trend of lack of trust in government, especially in the United States, but everywhere. Because there is no trust, you have replaced, the system has replaced trust, uh, a lack of trust or mistrust for rules and checks and balances. And now we are at a point in which we are choking on checks and balances. Uh, and we need to bring back some power, uh, some democratically controlled power to the executive. I think that that's very important. And how do you do that? Uh, I think a very important element of that is a concept or an institution that is almost never mentioned anymore. And it happens to be the foundation of democracy. And that is political parties. Whenever I speak at college campuses, I tell them, uh, there is this butterfly in Indonesia that is uh, going extinct. And I am creating a non-governmental organization, an NGO, that is going to try to save uh, the butterfly. How many of you would like to join me in this initiative to save the butterfly in Indonesia? Inevitably, several people raise their hands, and they're ready to help. Then I say, listen, no, that was not true. I know nothing about butterflies. It doesn't exist. 
I made it up. I was just gouging your willingness to change the world, to save, the, do, do good. But now I have another example, and I want to ask you, I'm going to join a political party. The one that we together decide, let's, how many of you would want to come with me and join a political party? They rush for the exits. <laughs> that story is what I use to exemplify the fact that uh, in the last decade or two, uh, political parties have had a horrible run. And non-governmental organizations have had a wonderful run. So take any young person or any activist, any idealist, any person that wants to do good, that wants to change the world or the city or the country, and uh, they will join. Uh, they're, they're probably very active, and they will probably join uh, all kinds of initiatives. And what happens is that those initiatives are always, almost always, uh, a single issue. It's either about poverty, or it's about the environment, or butterflies in Indonesia. So you can allow yourself to center in one aspect. Political parties don't have that luxury. Political parties have to have policies, ideas about kindergarten and nuclear weapons, the exchange rate and agriculture, uh, and all kinds of stuff. And very often, uh, the dilemmas and the trade-offs are not between in politics and in government, as many of you know. Uh, are not between picking between the wonderful and the horrible. It's just choosing between the horrible and the terrible. And uh, that, that is not something that comes natural to people that are not close to the debates, the policy debates. And that is one of the functions that political parties have to perform in attracting, recruiting, promoting, uh, socializing, uh, and giving uh, idealists uh, the opportunity to, to, to work with them. And so what's happening is that uh, political parties have uh, lagged behind in uh, developing the attractiveness uh, for young professionals or for people that want to change the world. And that's very bad because NGOs and the movements and all kinds of initiatives are very, go are very good at disrupting, but they're not very good at governing. And we need, uh, desperately need innovations in the way we govern ourselves. Sir. Hi, yes, please. Uh, Bill Herman, uh, Department of Commerce, retired. Uh, can you think of a couple of areas where power could really be um, responsible? Uh, say, for example, uh, in the health area, you have a horrible virus that suddenly affects the world. And we have to, we have to do something. Or say in astronomy, uh, there's, a, there's an asteroid heading right for Earth. Is there a couple areas you can think about where we, we would address power in a, in a more responsible area, a way? Yeah, well, there, there are, the question has two parts. One is uh, identifying uh, places or situations where that is happening, or imagining situations where that will force us uh, for that to happen. And of course, uh, the idea that an asteroid, you know, what would happen if we now have a definite confirmation that in 50 years from now, an asteroid is going to hit the, the Earth? What kinds of behavior will that entice uh, and what it, that would do in people? And perhaps we create, we don't know, right? That, that's a very interesting thought experiment and uh, an experiment in, in, in human behavior. So I, I don't know. But we have seen, uh, uh, oddly enough, at, mo at points, at moments, we have seen responsible behavior. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is almost a miracle that the Soviet Union went down without creating hundreds of millions of casualties in a war. Think about that. It, you know, in theory, if in 1980, I would have told you, how does this end? The confrontation between this superpowers armed with nuclear weapons at very, very aggressively against each other for global domination. How does this end? Most of us would have guessed that it would end in armed conflict. And then, yet, the Soviet Union went down without a single shot being fired. And I believe that that is part of responsible behavior. It, it happened, and it can happen. Sir. Peter Alpert, National Science Foundation. I was wondering if you could apply your thesis to war 
Do you think that the power to go to war has diminished as well? Absolutely. Because, uh, well, first, the definition of war has changed. As you perhaps know better than I, traditional interstate wars, the frequency of interstate wars between nation states has, since the end of the Cold War has declined precipitously. Countries don't go to war against other countries these days. Uh, instead, what happens is that the groups, very strange groups, go to war against each other or against nation states. Think about the most recent wars in which the United States has been involved. Uh, and think about the nature of combatants. Think about the nature of war. Think about doctrines. Think about the kinds of uh, tactics and strategies that are used by, by the armed forces. Uh, so if you have a, a different definition of what war is, then declaring war becomes a different conversation, which is much harder. And then we have the, the notion that also is related to the Gulliver tied down by thousands of strings that limit its behavior, that governments' democracies are becoming very sensi sensitized to casualties. Just think about major decisions um, of war or, or changes in war tactics that have taken place in the world today in, in Europe. The Italians decided, uh, the Spaniards decided to just withdraw from Iraq once uh, they had a bunch of casualties in one of their units. The day after, the government, by huge marches in the streets, was forced to just say, you know, we're not playing anymore. We go and you know, we take our weapons and go home. Uh, in the United States, uh, you, you know the story about how Somalia ended up defining Rwanda and uh, the, the, in the 90s. By that, I mean, of course, the well-known story of Black Hawk Down and all of the fiasco and the casualties and the TV images of uh, US military personnel dead being dragged in the streets and creating an imaginary uh, that essentially led that when the massacres and the genocide in Rwanda took place, there was a very, very difficult political decision decision to go ahead and, and do something there. So the sensitivity to war and to go to war now, uh, it has a public, uh, uh, public dimension to it that I think, uh, yes, it's, it has made, it's, it's, it's paradoxical because on, on the one hand, it has made declaring war uh, a more complicated decision, but at the same time, you're waging war with all kinds of different combatants and in different contexts at the same time. So it's very contradictory. Sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Nick. I'm an intern at the National Science Foundation. Um, definitely found your comments very intriguing, especially about uh, the decay of power, the void it's kind of creating, or it, that's implied, um, how trust is turning into rules. And so um, my question is, is there any truth to like some of these plot lines in these modern um, sci-fi movies, such as The Terminator or The Matrix or iRobot, in the sense that you know these values are being encoded and maybe they're not really humane? And let me remind you, I am an intern. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about robots at war. Think about the heightened and the far more frequent use of drones and robots and uh, all kinds of machinery uh, that is uh, remotely controlled and, and managed. And that takes you closer to that kind of a world. But I, I don't have a good answer for you. Very good question. Yes. Yeah, my name's Robin Schaefer, and I do environmental and conservation policy. And I was wondering about your response to something I think is assumed among those of us who do work on environmental um, concerns, which is that your three revolutions, the increase in consumption and population, the mo increase in mobility and the un instability of values, actually only that work so well, as you've described, to keep tyranny in check only seem to have a positive effect on people. And so if you admit of a world that contains more than just people, um, the upshot might not be quite so positive. Yeah, and it's true, and we are seeing a very frustrating public um, opinion reaction to the whole climate debate. 
uh, we see a public that uh, seems to have made peace with the notion that it's inevitable that uh, the, the Earth surface incre temperature increases by two or three degrees. They, they don't seem to care much. They, they seem to have been you know, resigned to the fact that this is inevitable, and that is part of that dynamic. On the other hand, uh, and, and you're right that the world of more consumes more energy and, and, and uh, creates more pollution and, and CO2 emissions. That's also true. Uh, on the other hand, you have to hope that uh, there will be more opportunity to intervene, that people like you can do something about it, that uh, this is no longer the game or, or governments or big corporations, that individual citizens empowered by the three revolutions can organize and change the world. There is, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's easy or it is about to happen, but you know, if the little girl taking pictures of her cafeteria food can change that, it's a very minuscule, perhaps too small example, but it illustrates uh, the opportunities that are out there. I don't want to sound Pollyannish. I am very worried, and I do believe that there, you know, this is not going to happen unless politicians get a very, very strong signals uh, from their voters that they want change in climate policies, in biological, you know, protecting biological diversity and all that. On the other hand, we seem to have uh, the support uh, of very strong signals uh, coming from Mother Earth and Mother Nature. So we now had, last, last month, we have the biggest floods in Germany in 500 years. We have the tornadoes. We have, you know, the, the, the environment, the climate is sending signals. And who knows? You know, it may be that uh, when you start looking at the consequences of what's going on, not because you're watching TV, but because you opened the, the, the window in your house, uh, that will then lead, lead more people to act. And one that, once that happens, the opportunities for intervention uh, are more. But you are right. Sir. Uh, Jonathan Cooper Smith, Texas A&M Uni University. Um, for this being your talk particularly in Washington, D.C., and uh, at, the, at the AAAS, uh, you know, calls out the obvious question, where do we go from here? And I think one, one of the um, real questions I have is that as we go more towards what could be a, dis, a distributed, decentral, more de decentralized mode of decision making, decision office, um, decision, decision blocking, um, what sort of paths do you see for ways of small scale, medium scale, and large scale experimentations at uh, solving some of these problems and creating some more of the oppor opp opportunities that you mentioned? That's a very tough question. And uh, the, it depends on the sector, and it depends on the issues, and it depends even in, on the country. Uh, but I can only repeat, I, I don't have any magic bullets or any, any, any clear um, prescriptive or predictive uh, thing. All, all I know is that uh, I stick by the what I said. This is a world of opportunity. And this is a world of opportunity for people that didn't have it before. And in the same way that that can be very problematic for those that have power, it can be very empowering and very energizing for those 